Thank you very much for the introduction. And uh, lovely to be here again with all the Anacumpas and a uh, great opportunity to be here. Much gratitude to everyone who's been helping out with these talks for the last, for the whole of the rains and for Venerable Chanda and Venerable Pekka for inviting me along. And uh, to kick off, I just want to acknowledge the Gundagara people who are the traditional owners of the land of uh, which we are coming from here and pay respects to their elders past, present and emerging, especially on this day where a lot of the Indigenous people in Australia are really kind of coming down from a pretty of a bit of a tragic kind of event if you've been following the news. So I think it's important to recognise that and we're very grateful here. Um, for all the custodianship of the land that they provided. So we're going to start off with a little bit of meditation. So if everybody wants to just make sure they're comfortable and relaxed. When you're ready, you can close your eyes. And just bring your attention into your body. If you've been rushing to get here, then just feel that energy and you might just want to take a couple of deep breaths to relax and just settle into a meditation space. Just feeling any energy that's built up from before and just letting go of the past. Letting go of any conversations, chores, jobs, anything that's just happened. Letting go of the future, feeling any tugs in your body, worries or concerns, plans, things that you're excited about. Just feel what that feels like if it's there. Acknowledging that. And seeing it with wisdom. And just being clear that now's the time for meditation. So we can let that all go. Just noticing what it feels like to be here. Any tension, any moods, that's okay. Just acknowledge them, however you're feeling. Just feel those sensations in your body. And just feeling the weight of the body on the seat. Bringing that connectedness and groundedness.
recognizing any sensations in your feet. If there's nothing there, then you can give your toes a little wriggle. Just connect with caring attention. Moving your attention to the tops of your feet. Your ankles. Just creating space, acceptance and kindness. Not trying to change anything. Is changing how you relate to things. Continuing moving up your calves. And your knees. Your thighs. You're feeling the weight of your body through your sitting bones. Feeling that grounded awareness. Relaxing the muscles through your hips and your pelvis. And just stretching up through your lower back if it needs it. Ah. Letting go of any tension in the abdomen. Just being aware of the whole lower part of the torso. The kindness and acceptance. Creating space for it to just be how it is. Taking that tiny step back. And uh, moving your attention up your back. Relaxing the muscles around the shoulder blades. under the arms. Opening out the shoulders. Just letting them hang like from a coat hanger. Your arms Just relaxed, just how they are. If you need to adjust your hands to a more comfortable position, that's okay. 
Just checking with them. How are you doing, hands? Notice the sensations in this very sensitive part of the body. Bring the attention back to the shoulders and up through the neck and the throat. Sometimes there might be a knot there where we're trying to repress the verbal processes that are still going on in our minds. Just notice what that feels like. See if you can create a bit of space around that feeling if it's there. Moving up the back of the head, the base of the skull. Just creating space and noticing any sensations. Noticing the sensations around the eyebrows and forehead. Relaxing, letting go of any tension. All those thinking processes can come to a stop for now. Relaxing around the jaw or in the mouth. Just taking a step back to observe how the body feels now. Just any tiny little bit of relaxation, or if there's a large bit of relaxation, just notice it. Enjoy it. Ah, that feels good. It's feeling what a relaxed body feels like. You might notice the natural coming and going of the breath. So soft and gentle. It's been there looking after us for all these years.
Just let it do its job of soothing and bringing life and energy to the body and the mind. Just mindfully be aware. If the mind starts thinking about other things, just don't worry about it. And let that go. And just come back to what's most important right now. giving priority to peace and stillness.
And as we come to what's the end of the meditation, just take a moment to reflect back. What were the different stages of the meditation? Were you able to create some space? Experience some peace and feel the gentleness of the breath. How did that work? Which bits of the meditation worked for you and how? and reflecting on how you feel now compared to the beginning of the meditation. Doing this reflection at the end of each meditation allows us to see with our own wisdom, how the meditation works, gives us confidence to practice. And finally, we can share the merit of the meditation. May all beings be happy. May all beings be well. May all beings be peaceful. May all beings realize the highest peace, Nibbana. Sad, sad, sad. When you're ready, you can open your eyes. <laughs> Lovely. Well, I hope... Uh, Everybody enjoyed that. And uh, I guess next in the program is a Dharma talk. <laughs> so it was a very long time ago when Venerable Chanda asked me for a topic for the, uh, for the Dharma talk. And I'm not actually quite sure what I was thinking about when I said, oh, I'm going to give a talk about the patient path. So I've tried to weave some things about patients in. But really, what I think what I was thinking was I didn't takes a really long time to progress along the path, right? And sometimes we can get a little bit discouraged or we can think that we're not making progress. So today I want to talk about how we can stay motivated with our practice and develop skillfulness, which can move us closer to like bliss, wisdom and enlightenment. Because bliss, peace, wisdom, and enlightenment, you know, they're the attractive qualities, right? They're the, they're the ones we kind of want to go after. Patience, it's not so attractive. I mean, it's useful, but it's not, not that attractive. <laughs> you know, we all want to have jhanas. We want to be free from suffering. And sometimes we can get very focused on maybe one or two parts of the path at the cost of other aspects. So we might become very focused on the meditation practice. This is common in uh, Western circles, definitely. You know, it'd be great if we could just sit down and let go, but for most of us, it's just not that easy. Uh, you know, we can get distracted with everyday things or we could be disheartened. Um, so I just want to give some tools today that, that we can pick up that I've found useful, useful anyway. So when we think of the Eightfold Path, we think of it like a linear practice, like going from your front door 
to the front gate. And if you've been practicing for a little while, you might have found out it's not that easy. You might have found out it's not just like taking eight steps and you're there. It's a really long way and it takes a long time. And you can you can sometimes like be, oh, I don't know if this is working. So what we can do is we can ask, are we following the instructions? Are we using the tools that the Buddha gave us? And of course, we need a lot of patience to follow the path. So instead of thinking of it like a path that goes from your front door to the front gate, what is useful is maybe to think about it like a building with eight floors. Each of the factor, factors are like structural supports for the next factor. So let's just quickly remind ourselves about what the eight factors of the Eightfold Path are. Of course, it's right view, right intention, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right samadhi. So most of us, we come from like a re results-oriented culture. We want to know that we're making progress. So if the past path isn't like a garden path and it's more like a building and it makes sense to invest in those kind of strong structural foundations which will support and strengthen the building. So the reason that I have a list of tools for you today is that it's nice to feel like you're making progress. It's nice to feel like you're doing something. When it comes to the later stages of the path, things like deep meditation and jhana, letting go is really important. But the Buddha in his first sermon said, in the Dharma Chakapavatana Sutta, he said, the path is bhavetabhang, it's to be developed. So patience is important, but it doesn't mean just sitting around twiddling our thumbs. It's not about complacency. In the Ovada Patimoka, the Buddha said, kanti paramang tapo didika. Patient acceptance is the foremost way to burn up defilements. There's all sorts of other funny translations that are around about that, but it's it's about it's using the tapas that they had in the Brahmin tradition, that burning up, and talking about burning up to get to enlightenment. So patient acceptance is like an active force. It's not a passive thing. So I did a little bit of thinking about patience and what its friends are and kind of what the near enemies are, like how we can kind of slip from patience into less wholesome qualities. And I came up with a list of four things. I think there's a lot of list of four things in this actually that we'll get to. So we've got patience and acceptance and then tolerance and ignorance, right? So the first two are definitely kind of Wholesome qualities, wisdom qualities, patience and acceptance and about knowing what's wholesome and what's in line with the Dhamma. Whereas tolerance and ignorance, they're kind of sliding a little bit further away. You know, so tolerance can go both ways. It's like in some circumstances the Buddha said that we should tolerate things. So like in the Sabhasava Sutta in Majjhima Nikaya 2, the Buddha said that we should reflect with pay, with wisdom on painful and painful physical feelings and using that reflection we should tolerate them but it's very easy in that situation then to kind of slide into ignorance without that wisdom without that wise reflection that yoni manasikara then we can very easily slide into ignorance and even aversion so that's definitely something to keep an eye out in your practice. You can start thinking, oh, this isn't working. So a while ago, I came across this nice talk from Ajahn Chah, and he uses, he explains about trying to reach the bottom of a hole. But most of us, we're trying to reach the bottom of a hole and we can't do it. And he says, don't go blaming the hole for being too deep turn around and look at your arm. 
it's like a great reminder for us to use wisdom, right? Because we can blame all sorts of external circumstances. But if we're not practicing with wisdom, then we totally miss the point. I think it's just such a nice little thing. So what are these tools that we can use to develop this wisdom so that we can go, don't go blaming the whole or sliding into ignorance or complacency? So today I thought I'd focus on uh, two different groups, well, three different groups, sorry, the five injuries and the four idipadas and how they can be applied to the Eightfold Path. So the five indriyas are like the guiding facti, uh, faculties or the controlling faculties. Indra was like a war god in the time, I guess, of the Buddha. So, but these are like faculties that can guide your mind. So the first one is faith, sadda. The next one's energy, virya. Got mindfulness, sati. Stillness, samadhi. And wisdom, which is panya. And then we've got another list here, which is the four idipadas, which I'm translating as the basis for mental potency. You might have heard them as the basis for psychic power as well. So the first one is chanda with an H, not like our venerable chanda, and that's, that's desire. Uh, we've got virya, which is energy again. So that's coming up again. So then we've got chitta, which is the mind. And this kind of seems to encompass both the stillness and the mindfulness aspects that we had in that previous list, and Vimangsa, which is review. So we already had a little bit of a practice of that at the end of our meditation. So you can see these are really quite similar lists. So I kind of got to thinking that, you know, depending on your personality, whether you're a, you know, more of a faith kind of person or a wisdom type of person, you might pick these up as just different tools to kick off your path, kick off your journey. And then they can be used kind of similarly, you know, bring up the energy and you do the mental development and have the wisdom aspect. And both of these then, you know, through the energy factor, tie into the four right efforts, which are used to sustain and cultivate mental qualities. So as a reminder, the four right efforts are abandon, restrain, cultivate and maintain. So we're going to try and abandon the unwholesome and to develop and cultivate the wholesome. Simple, right? Well, we hope. <laughs> so we've got these two sets of four and a set of five. Sometimes it's useful to go, how many were there again? Which one am I missing? So we can keep it, try and keep these in mind as we go through the eightfold path and see how we can use them to stay patient and motivated. These are tools which we can use throughout the day to strengthen our building foundations and progress towards peace. So then if we can pick these up throughout the day, it's not just about our meditation. The injuries and idipadas tie in so nicely to the eightfold path. And the order is really important. So don't go picking the tools up in the wrong order. It's like grabbing the wrong kind of sandpaper. You're going to be doing a lot of work if you're trying to sand something with the really fine sandpaper. So we start off with chanda, which is desire, and faith, which is which is sadda. And this ties nicely into the first factor of the Eightfold Path, which is right view. So understanding why we're on the path and why we want to follow it. Reflecting on the reasons you became interested in practice. So for some people, this might have been like a difficult time in our lives or when, you know, something went from good to bad you know we saw that change that even you know the, the the good things can kind of just turn sour or maybe it was just the faith that there's a more peaceful and skillful way to live you know seeing the example in the buddha in the dharma reading the suttas something kind of sparked your interest or just knowing that there are enlightened people around or maybe it was just reflecting that our actions really do have consequences and direct our future mind states so stuff about karma, seeing that we can have intentional actions which affect our everyday life. So then this brings us to right intention. It, it comes from this motivation, this view, either from our faith or our desire to get out of suffering, our desire to practice. 
And it's useful just to reflect again and again, why are we on this path? We set our intention to not get caught up in the things that are a little spiritual value this way. We need to do our day-to-day -day activities. Sure, you know, even in the monastery, we've got things we have to do. And it's not that we can just be, you know, focused on the meditation the whole time. But if we're motivated from the right place, if we've got that desire and that faith in the practice, then we can do them in a way which cultivates these skillful qualities that gives rise to a pure, clean kind of energy to run on. If we get clear on our priorities and do our best to program our mindfulness to maintain these priorities, they can really change the way that we approach our day-to-day -day stuff. So if we get clear that renunciation, kindness and harmfulness are more important than getting stuff, getting our own way and doing things at the cost of others, then it's a different way of looking at things. But the problem is that we're kind of being dragged around by this sense of self and me and mine. It's just our unenlightened nature to fall into this trap. So again, we have to build those foundations based on right view, based on the desire to practice. And when we see it, we just pick it up again. You know, we go back down to that ground floor and we start climbing back up those stairs again, you know. So the analogy of the building kind of comes in nicely in that sense. So, you know, when we fall into anger or these unwholesome qualities, we can feel what that energy feels like inside of us. We can feel that it's not that pure, clean energy, that brightness in our minds. We can use the power of reflection and wisdom to reflect on our thinking and ask, how is the way we're thinking leading towards or away from renunciation, kindness and peace? These are really important foundations, ones that we're going to have to come back to again and again and strengthen. And... It's not a chore. I mean, these are really nice qualities to build up. <laughs> so these are these can bring up like this beautiful energy to have another go, just to keep going, just to encourage yourself, just to, you know, bring up that kindness, bring up more gentleness. We can see it in other people as well. So we just steady our minds using our wisdom and reflection along the way. So there's a nice sutra in the Sangita Nikaya, which I thought I'd read to you. It's uh, SN 1412, which explains how these foundations work. So, and how do thoughts of renunciation, goodwill and harmlessness arise for a reason, not without a reason? The element of renunciation gives rise to perceptions of renunciation. Perceptions of renunciation give rise to thoughts of renunciation. Thoughts of renunciation give rise to enthusiasm for renunciation. Enthusiasm for renunciation give rise to fervor for renunciation. Fervor for renunciation gives rise to the search for renunciation. An educated noble disciple on a search for renunciation behaves well in three ways, by body, speech, and mind. Before is such a funny word. It's like that fired up energy though. So that brings us to, right to the right speech. It's a big topic and it's a lot to go into. And I, yeah, I'd love to just talk about that for a whole thing, but um, not that much time. <laughs> so one of the important things that we have to remember though is right speech is about our responsibility when we're speaking. It's not about our right to speak. So we train to take responsibility in how we speak. This is such a gift that we can give to the world. So right speech is divided into the fourfold training. So the one that we're most familiar with is refraining from lying and telling the truth. It's in the five precepts, and I spoke a little bit about this in the last talk. So I'll talk about the other three aspects just a little bit more today. Um, they're really kind of nice ones to pick up. So the first one is giving up divisive speech. So the Buddha defines that as they don't repeat in one place what they've heard in another 
who divide people against each other. Instead, they reconcile those who are divided, supporting unity, delighting in harmony, loving harmony, speaking words that promote harmony. Isn't that beautiful? They give up harsh speech. They use speech which is polite and gentle. They give up talking nonsense. Their words have, you know, they, they don't speak words that have no value or that are untimely, rambling, unreasonable or pointless. And, you know, the thing that's really stood out to me, we were having some conversations about, you know, conflict and difficult situations um, the other day after Dana with some of the people who were here. And I really was thinking about that phrase, delighting in harmony. Isn't that just beautiful? So like at the time when there's huge amounts of conflict in the world with all the stuff that's going on in Israel and Palestine and, you know, the news can also be very divisive, right? Speech is a tool that we as Buddhists can give to the world. Sure, we can spread meta to people in these war-torn areas and that's a really nice thing for us to do for them. But in our communities, we can also take action. We're not powerless. We can encourage people to have civil and peaceful conversations and discussions and investigate where their views come from. Because divisive speech is like an active force. It's from this divisive speech that the violence comes up. It's the nonsense that the news propaganda and all those fake news things kind of in social media spread that cause this misinformation. And it's the harsh speech where we don't just lower that tone. We don't just kind of cool down enough to be able to have a civil conversation. So like when I see people who are really good at bringing people together, that they're able to have that kind of quietness in the way they speak, they're able to bring people together and just meet in the center. It's just like this beautiful thing. And it's something that I definitely want to pick up more and train in more. I, think I find it really inspiring. So in the Salaika Sutta, the Buddha talks about having the intention to bring up these skillful qualities. He says, Chunda, I say that even giving rise to the thought of skillful qualities is helpful, let alone following that path in body and speech. That's why you should give rise to the following thoughts. Others will be cruel. But here, we will not be cruel. Others will kill living creatures, but here we will not kill living creatures. Goes through all the precepts, the five precepts. Others will be attached to their own views, holding them tight and refusing to let go. But here, we will not be attached to our own views, not holding them tight, but we will let them go easily. I mean, that's, that speaks to a lot of the difficulties in conflict, uh, and conflicts that we have in our day-to-day -day lives. So here's an example where both kinds of effort are used. It's like the effort to develop and it's also the effort to let go. So right action is kind of encompassed in that, right? It's something we spoke about a bit more if you caught the sealer as a superpower talk already. So I'm not going to go into that too much. So that basically is like the covering the precepts around avoiding killing, avoiding stealing, avoiding sexual misconduct. And we can see how these things are built on the views, built on the intentions, built on the speech and misinformation or, inf or truth that is available to us, right? If people could take the time to examine their speech and their views, we'd have so much less conflict, you know, so much less people taking up these weapons and meeting each other and seeing each other for who they are. So the other thing, I'm just going to bring this up again because it's just so nice. If we've been practicing the five precepts for a long time, we can kind of get complacent, right? We can forget about how powerful they are. So I'm just going to say it again. Reflect on your successes, right? Reflect and empower your mind through bringing up your virtue and your generosity. It's something the Buddha says to do. It's part of that faith aspect. See how keeping your precepts and living harmless, harmlessly is like motivating. If you're not sure how to do it, then have a look in the Mahanama Sutta. It's in the Anguttara Sixes. So next in the Eightfold Path, we've 
got the right livelihood. And like traditionally, we've got a list of things which are like the occupations which we wouldn't do. So most of us, we're not butchers, we're not selling intoxicants, we're not uh, we're not selling weapons, we're not dealing in warfare, those kind of things. And so it's really easy to just go, tick, okay, that one's done. But uh, I was listening to a good talk from Monte Sajato at the beginning of the year and he was saying how it's like a whole path factor, right? And I really clicked on that. I was like, oh, yeah, it, how can this one be so easy and all the others, you know, you know, you got to put some work into it. <laughs> so it's really easy to skip over this. But how many times, you know, do you say or do you hear people say, I'm too busy to practice? You know, I've got all my work, I've got my chores, I've got my family. And it's so easy to then kind of forget about these things. But really, again, it's just about setting that intention and bringing that energy up so that we can keep practicing right throughout the day. Checking in with ourselves and just seeing how we're going. So something I've been doing for the last year is just having like physical checkpoints throughout my day. So like if I'm walking from my hut up to the main house, then like I've got a series of trees and like they're my markers to just check in with myself. Like, how are you doing? Where's my mind at right now? And it's really useful because you can see kind of where you're at, where your practice is at, what's bothering you. And you can just ground yourself back to see your feet. Or like I come in and... Yeah, I sit down at the computer and I've got my emails and my chores to do and stuff like that for the monastery. And it's very easy to just be like, oh, I've got to do these chores. I've got to write to reply to all these emails. And it's just, you know, we've all got things we've got to do like that. And so just bringing up the reflection, what am I doing and why? Just bringing that up throughout the day, right? And like, bringing yourself that what am I doing it's just like okay what am I doing right now what's the most important thing to be doing and why am I doing it because we can be all like grumble grumble I don't want to do this or we can be doing this with a wholesome motivation to practice generosity to practice kindness to practice harmlessness and letting go well it can just be like that mindfulness exercise just just having those markers to bring yourself back and, you know, I was talking to a friend about this the other day and she works from home and, I'm, you know, I think a lot more people are doing that these days and it's really hard just because it's like work's always there and I know what that was like. I worked from home uh, for most of my career before I ordained. And so just having ways to have markers just so that you know what you're doing at each point in time. Just checking in, how are you doing? Am I getting obsessed? Am I getting grumpy about this? And noticing, look, if you're getting sucked in, just to catch yourself and do that reset. Using that power of reflection, that power of mindfulness, just to steady the mind. You know, you might want to take just 10 seconds just to settle back and focus back on exactly what you're trying to do. Bring your mind into like a wholesome direction. And, you know, I find this really motivating for myself because then I know that throughout the day I am just practicing the path. I can feel like I'm actually putting in effort to drive, drive my mind into a more wholesome direction. So you can see right the way through we've been cultivating these four right efforts. They're kind of coming together in a worldly sense within the right livelihood. You can see all those factors, all those kind of lower levels which lead to the next, you know, build that foundation up. It's almost like a pyramid or even more than a building, right? So they're all based on this solid, wide foundation of right intention and right view. Doesn't mean it's linear, right? We have to remember that we're going to come back down to that ground floor, reinforce it and build up those foundations again. So it's just a reminder then throughout the day just to check in, to check whether you're being complacent, whether you're still practicing along the way because if you are you are be feeling really good about yourself if you're practicing well if you're putting in that little bits of effort just to remember to practice the path then it's more likely you want to sit down and meditate your foundations will be really strong so 
right effort's just not just the effort to let go. That's like one side. And then the other side is about cultivation. Effort founded on the right view and right intention can give rise to a wealth of energy. Because actually what I've found is if you put forth effort, you'll be happy. And that's a really useful thing to remember on those days when you're feeling really lazy, right? If you're sitting there and go, I don't know if I can be bothered meditating. I might just kind of watch something on Netflix. Right? I might just veg on the couch and scroll on my iPad. <laughs> I mean, obviously I don't do that. I don't have a couch. Um, and I don't have Netflix. But it's really important just to be clear on what you're doing, knowing that beginning, that middle and the end of what you're doing. So like when you're doing your chores or you're doing your work, even when you're watching TV, you're like, okay, I'm going to sit down and watch TV. This is what I'm doing. I'm going to watch this show. And then at the end, you know, okay, look, the show is over. I can turn it off now. I can just let go of that energy. And like, you know, it's just like 10 seconds. You can feel that fizz and you can just wait. Bring yourself back to that clear space again. Just take that time. It's like a real gift towards yourself. Because then when you sit down to meditate, you won't have to spend your whole meditation just putting things down. You won't have like this whirlwind of all the things that you've done today, all those conversations you've had. It's like, it's so nice. You'll feel happy. You feel like you've invested your energy in something that's really worthwhile. There'll be like a greater steadiness and stillness. And you want to meditate. It's that desire to practice. It'll be there. And that faith that the path actually works. You'll be like, oh, yeah, look, if I follow the instructions, this is what the Buddha said. And that's kind of like just builds up more faith. So it's like then you can just try and set that intention just to do a little bit of meditation practice each day. You know, 10 minutes, 20 minutes. Try for it every day. But, you know, if you miss a couple of days, that's all right. You know, maybe five days a week. But be clear in your mind when it's time for the meditation that it's time for the meditation. And then know the stages and just guard those little pieces of peace. Notice what they're like. Just, just the little gaps even between the craziness, between the busyness. And that's how the, you can apply like the four right efforts at this level, at the meditation level. That's what we've been training all along the way. So then we can kind of bring them together. And this kind of helps us keep motivated. We started to develop the mindfulness in like everyday life as a guiding faculty. And we tried to be consistent and even minded with our conduct. This is setting the stage for that peak development of the mind to get to those really attractive kind of things. At this stage, I thought it was good to kind of go back and look at those five guiding faculties again and apply them in our meditation. Because this is really how the Buddha talked about it. So it's that faith to bring joy to our mind, reflecting on the Buddha, the Dharma, the Sangha, and our sila. It's that energy of abandoning the unwholesome and developing the wholesome, the virya, the four right efforts. It's the mindfulness. And in this case, the Buddha talks about using it in the kind of like using the satipatthanas, using different method, whatever your method is, and being clear of your method of meditation. The samadhi, this is where we come together, where it all comes together, hopefully one day for us. We can keep strengthening that path until we have a powerful mind that can enter into jhana. And it's that panya. It's the realization of the four noble truths. So we can see how these are basic tools, but they're also very advanced tools. That might seem a long way off. And of course, this is why it's the patient path. So my goal today was to try and offer some tools which we can use to help us progress up until this point. We can feel like we're making a bit of progress each day. Just a little drop in the bucket. You can see the drop, drop, drop. And one day the bucket will overflow. It'll fill up and overflow with bliss and peace. But in the meantime, you can see those little drops filling up. And, you know, that seems like it's worthwhile then. So keep reviewing, keep learning how things work. Investigate how your own practice works. You know, use that wisdom power. Bring up that skill throughout the day. Not just, you know, don't investigate during your meditation, but do the investigation afterwards. 
and do that review at the end of each day. How's your day gone? You know, we can gain these small little bits of wisdom. And, you know, don't worry too much. Life's got its ups and downs. Our bodies have its natural cycles and things like that. And so then it's good to also look back at the end of the day and just see, sorry, at the end of a year and just see how we're doing. You know, we might go on a retreat or something like that. And maybe it's been six months or a year. We can see how that cultivating and mindfulness throughout the day, the cultivating of our virtue and the cultivating of our generosity really feed in to like a happier and more steady mind. So stay patient and keep applying yourself. Hopefully we've all gained some inspiration to develop the path factors further. Maybe there was like an aspect in there that really stood out to you. Maybe you just, there's something there, one thing that you just want to kind of pick up and train with for a while. Maybe it's a speech. Maybe it's just that intention, just building up those foundations again. So as a quick reminder, we've got the guiding faculties, which are faith, energy, mindfulness, samadhi, and wisdom, both at that kind of mundane level and at that very high level. And we've got the four sources of mental potency, desire, energy, steadiness, and review. And they can help you get through all sorts of different projects, whatever you need to do. And the four right efforts, the effort to abandon, restrain, cultivate, and remain. Maintain or remain. Uh, these tools can be used in our everyday life and they can be used to specifically focus our meditation. They kind of lean on each other really, right? They're not two separate things. So see if you can remember these three different sets and apply them to strengthening your path. And hopefully patience isn't going to slide into like complacency and ignorance, right? And we can see that we're progressing and that our life is like meaningful and happy and getting energy from wholesome sources. So I offer that for your reflection. And may you find something of benefit. I think we're going to go to questions now, right? <laughs> Thank you very much, Venerable Pasana. That was a really beautiful talk. <laughs> Would anybody have any questions? I know everybody here has been here many times, so knows the routine of putting up digital hand or waving your real life hand as well. It's fine. <laughs> James. Thank you for the wonderful talk, Venerable. Uh, thank you. It's very inspiring. Um, I like the thoughts of um, keeping the practice in mind and all these, all the elements you mentioned um, throughout the day. I think um, I'm, I'm, I'm glad how my practice has gone in, in sort of more in recent years, how I know when I began, it was all sort of on the mat. And it was really when I sort of started to take it out into the world and bear these things in mind. And, Little bit by bit, I think, you know, you've got to be patient with it, haven't you? It's um, just just remembering all these things at all times, it's sort of hard, but uh, bit by bit you get better. Yeah. But, um, I don't know whether this quite fits in, but the, I've been thinking about the title, um, about patience and everything, and patience has certainly been important for me this past year. I think, um, I think I had a bit of a turning point, really, learning to be more patient with things and patient in meditation, patient with my sometimes with my aching body you know it's sort of um makes a lot of difference um or well, patience with other people and <laughs> but I, I, was, I was i was saying to someone the other day about how um is is there a different what's the difference between patience and equanimity equanimity never quite good okay. yeah I, I, yeah I, I, didn't, I, I didn't put that in my list did i that was i should have put that in the list because <laughs> yeah cause, yeah cause, I said, I said, I asked this question in a different Zoom session a few weeks ago, and they kind of weren't sure. And yeah. I've, I thought about it a bit, and and part, the, all I've got so far is that uh, I think patience can be like, like you you might be patient with your kids, but you still might find them a bit irritating. You know what I mean? Like, like 
<laughs> so I might be patient with the aches in my body, but I still might be a bit like, oh, if they would go, I'd have a fantastic meditation. Whereas I guess equanimity would be you've sort of generally genuinely accepted uh, and sort of let go of the sort of bad feelings around something. I, I'm, I'm really not sure, but I was wondering whether you had any uh, thoughts on that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm just thinking on the fly, but I think maybe where I was going with this was that equanimity is like that looking over. That's what the word upeka look, means literally. It's kind of looking upon in Pali. So that's kind of the equanimity that we might be thinking of. And what I was thinking, I think, with patience is that it's like we can put in, we can kind of, we're more guiding it, right? It's like we know that this is a situation, but we might be kind of just, we, we, we know that there are tools maybe that we can use to uh, not manipulate the situation, but just to keep picking up that more wholesome quality because we're not at that wholesome place yet. So I guess that's where I was coming from with like with this talk and and trying to kind of come up with a list of tools that we can use. And I th certainly know what it's like to be having a painful, aching body. I think at the beginning of the of the rains, I, you know, was struggling to sit for 10 minutes and my body was aching. And, you know, then with something like that, you need to have those tools, right? You need to be able to have that wisdom you know, when, when someone says something that wouldn't normally annoy you and you're like, feel like you're going to snap. And then you're like, oh no, it's just because my body hurts, right? It's those, those things like that. And so bringing up the different tools, that mindfulness, just keeping that steadiness when you want to flip out, bringing up the wisdom, those kind of different things. And, you know, it takes a little bit of patience with yourself because like sometimes you just lose it. <laughs> <laughs> sometimes you're not quite as cool as you'd like to be sometimes you just don't have that equanimity yet so it's that patience to be okay with yourself when you're not quite right just to go back and do that reset you know bring up that desire to practice again you know I think that's where the itty part can be really like useful throughout the day because it's like giving yourself that acceptance giving yourself that kindness and then once you start recognizing that in yourself you can recognize that in other people as well. Recognizing that, you know, maybe they're having a bad day because of certain conditions and stuff like that. And that allows you to be like more patient because you're using that wisdom, that right view that these things are conditioned, right? Your, your kids are being little brats out of certain conditions. They're not just doing it to annoy you <laughs> or your boss. You know, maybe they've got something going on at home you don't know about. Maybe their boss is breathing down their neck to achieve something as well. Yeah, all those different things. So bringing up that wisdom throughout the day, bringing up those wholesome qualities. And I think, you know, you need that patience just to keep practising like that. So I don't know if I've quite answered your question. I might have just kind of wiggled around it. But it's something to think about anyway. What do you reckon? Oh, I don't know, really. It's it's a lot to think about, isn't it? I suppose yeah. it's, it's like you say, it's it's a more more um, active reflection on things rather than mm. uh, jumping to conclusions. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Yeah, being, yeah. Being I think it's like more engaged, right? Yeah, 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 absolutely, yeah. It's sort of uh, yeah. not, not listening to the first thought that jumps into your head, which I suppose is quite often comes from a sort of um, defilement or from negative negativity, if, particularly if you're like um, in the habit of doing that kind of thing. Yeah. 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 I mean, um, yeah. I suppose it's patience with yourself as well, because sometimes if you realize a sort of a nasty thought comes up in response to someone else, you might then think bad about yourself because you've thought that. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. You're like, Oh, I've been practicing for all these years and I'm still having those nasty thoughts. But, you know, when you get to that point to spot them, you can actually ask that question. And it's it's so good. What is the other thought I can think? It's not just you, if you can change from beating yourself up to going like, how can I flip this, right? I, I could be so upset and I'm like, oh, that person so deserves it. Okay. But instead in, you can find something just to flip it around. You can think, you know, I'm actually 
whatever it is, you can find the goodness in that situation. You can pivot that story so that maybe it's just not true. You, you know, one of the one of the things I've seen in um in a book I was reading about act therapy was that you can just whatever you're thinking, you know, I'm so hopeless, and just put or not on the end, right? Just just doubt that for a second. Just put that or not on the end of your thought, and like. That's kind of powerful because then you don't believe those first stories. You know, they're just doing it to annoy me or not. (laughs) Yeah. All right. Uh, Minori has her hand up too. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was a wonderful talk and I'm going to listen to that a couple of times and make short notes as well but my <laughs> question is um being lay people we have so much of distractions as you said the netflix or social media or uh you get invited to people you know places things and uh, you know it is much difficult you know to lay those boundaries like the monastics do but then if you want to practice uh as well, it's very difficult to manage these things. And mm. could you advise on the refraining part a little bit for especially for the lay people? Thank you. Okay. So I think it's like in different situations we might want to approach this differently, but I think the most useful thing is to go into the situation knowing what the situation is, right? So like you go. I'm going to spend an hour watching this show. Yeah, I watch two episodes or something like this on Netflix. And you know that. You set your boundaries and you're clear on them because it's very easy for us to make excuses, right? At the end, we're like, oh, just click some more. So at the end of those, end of whatever that limit is, hit pause and just check in. How are you feeling? What's that feeling like? Because it's gone probably you know, that feeling where you want to do a, more, a little bit more, where you want to pick it up. It's not a nice feeling where you've set your boundary and then you're going to cross it, right? So I know that. Like I can I can get totally obsessed in a project if it's something I really want to do um, and I can I can be going for hours if I haven't set those boundaries. And I know after I've crossed that limit, what I think is like the wise place to be for me at that time, then it kind of has its diminishing returns and you kind of just kind of build up this kind of clingy energy, right? And you can notice that in your body if you just take that second to stop. Um, And I think that's the thing a lot with these kind of sensory input things that we do and You know, there might be different reasons that we're kind of picking this up, whether it's like social media or something like that. We might be picking up social media because it's nice to find out what our family are doing around the world and our friends are doing around the world. And it's that wholesome desire to connect, right? But we can also pick up social media because we're feeling a lack of connection, for example. And so that can really flip inside your body and you can check in with that, which is why I'm saying, you know, at those, have these break points, you know, you can set a little alert on on your phone and be like, okay, I just want to check in with how I'm feeling in 20 minutes time. And, and just see, like, I used to have a little timeout app on my computer and it would pop up on my screen and it would count down 20 seconds. And that was so useful, especially for working from home, because it gives you a chance to just refocus on that. And I think, yeah, it's different in these different situations. If we're kind of out interacting with friends, then it's maybe a different skill set that we want to focus on at that time. So maybe when we're out with our friends, we might just want to be focusing on having more meaningful conversations with them and things like that. So it's like we come in with a different intention for those different interactions. So we might want to, you know, when someone goes, how are you doing? Like if there's someone we know well, then it might be time to just have that more truthful kind of conversation, that conversation where you really get to know each other a little bit better because it's very easy to rush through and just talk about the kind of mundane aspects of life and stuff like that. But we can really build those connections 
build that kind of gentle speech and work on that right speech aspect, work on those kind of right intention aspects of our interactions with people. And, and you know, it's, it's something all of us can kind of practice more and more. I know people who do this just so well and they're just such a pleasure to be around. And it's like a gift they give to a whole room or something like that. So I think, yeah, it's different different things that we might want to pick up throughout the day. We might just be like, okay, well, when, when we're with our friends, we want to practice this this skill. When we're, uh, you know, on social media or, or doing kind of our leisure activities, we want to just do this way and stuff like that. So it's, it's something for all of us to remember. I'm saying this because I need to remember how to do this as well. <laughs> yeah, so... Yeah, what do you think? Yeah, good. Yeah, that is quite useful, Venerable. Thank you very much. Hey, Susie. Hi, um, Venerable Persona. Hello. Um, hi. Um, I really, I really just wanted to say, um, thank you for this talk. It really helps. Like the whole um um the whole energy kind of aspect, like I forget I forget how many there are, four, five potencies. But I, I had one list of four and one list of five, so yes. Yeah. <laughs> um but um I just wanted to say um thank you and also aspect of rejoicing like in people's good qualities. Like um what's something I've been trying to work on is Medita. Um, sympathetic joy so I was just want to ask what do you think about Medusa how can we cultivate it more how can we cultivate it more well there's I mean you can cultivate it as a meditation practice and if you've tried that but that's a really nice one and uh one of my teachers Bhante Sajato he teaches this um so you would sit down and actually go I rejoice in my own goodness I rejoice in my own goodness and just picking that feeling up for oneself, right? And just really getting to know what that feeling feels like in that kind of safe space of, of your meditation and just working with that until it's really kind of tangible, knowing what that mudita feeling really is, uh, seeing what it feels like throughout your whole body. Um, and then you can rejoice in someone who, you find it easy to rejoice in, you know, take your time really to establish that foundation in, if you're doing this as a meditation practice and get to know what those feelings are, get to know what that mudita really is within a safe space where we can cultivate this in our minds. And then, then you know what that is throughout the day. You're kind of inclining your mind towards this. Uh, and this is also something you can do kind of as part of your reviewing, you know. So when I was talking about the reviewing at the end of your day, you could actively say, bring up those things. You could be like, okay, I'm going to bring up these five things that were just like the special things that happened that, that people did throughout the day. You might have just seen someone help someone else out or something like that. So that's like a really, or you might have you might have done something yourself that, at the time you thought, oh, that was just a small thing because it's just your character to do that, right? But people, yeah, other people will be rejoicing in it and it's good to just rejoice in that as well. So that's that kind of like, you know, where the Buddha might talk about it as Chaga, Chaga Nusati as well, rejoicing in generosity and goodness and, and the seal in the Sati. It's kind of coming together. So it's that same kind of thing as doing the Mudita practice, just bringing those things up and reflecting on them at the end of the day and yeah, having those wholesome qualities before you go to bed is, is so nice because we can kind of just crash into bed either, you know, we've just been kind of tied out from the whole day, right? And it, it's, I know the difference myself. If I do something like that, if I do some medita or I do some metta, if I do a little bit of gratitude or reflect on my virtue or something like that before I go to bed, I know I wake up in the morning and like I'm so much more, ready to face the day I might have a bit of you know I have more inclination to do meditation practice and stuff like that so you know I think that's that's how I would approach it anyway great thank you so much Problem. thank you for your question
I would be very interested to hear about your perspective of the difference between individual practice and collective practice with regards to the different um, uh, the different perspectives that you've given in this talk. Is that possible? Because, for example, when you, when what do you mean by that? Sorry. When you're sitting in a in a hall with all of your other um, Bikuni sisters together, yep. there's yep. A, a different energy to when you're sitting in your hut by yourself. Yes. And does I'm a very solitary person. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a very solitary person. I like coming together. And um, this is a nice thing, actually. I, I, I didn't mention in the talk about uh, about right livelihood. It was something that when I had Bhante Sajato talking about right livelihood, something that he said, and he's very similar to me. He's like, he wants to practice on his own and he likes to be on his own. He, I've heard him say before, like, you know, if he never had to like see another person again, he'd be just perfectly happy. And, you know, I'm not quite like that. Like I do like to have a nice, honest, open conversation with my friends, but I get a lot of energy and recharging from being on my own as well. But something he said when he was here at Santi, he was the abbot uh, for a long time and did a lot of work here at Santi, establishing the monastery. And he said that when he was at Santi, he would remember as he was walking up to the, the main building that he would come to the main building to practice for himself, to let go of the selfishness and to let go of the laziness. And then when he went back to his heart, he was going back to his heart to practice for everybody else, to bring up those beautiful, wholesome qualities and that peacefulness. And I thought that really caught me because I was like, oh, that's so different from how we think about it, right? We think that it's me and my practice so often, like, you know, we've finally got some time to practice. And so it was really like a nice way, an interesting way to flip it. And again, it's that way of kind of like, dodging that complacency, letting go of that ignorance and, and bringing up those wholesome qualities. And I, I know that's kind of not where you were getting at, but uh, it's, it's a different way of thinking about it. And, you know, whether I'm sitting then in the hall with the other bakunis here and the community who, who, you know, who are helping look after us and that during the rains, then I am doing, you know, I'm doing that practice and bringing that energy for all of us then so it's no different than when I'm back in my hut that bit of the practice I'm you know I'm offering up to the community and I think that's also why it's nice to remember to share merits at the end of our meditation or at the end of our day as well because then we know that you know we, we are cultivating this for the benefit of others you know there's that kind of trope I don't know if that's the right word uh, for the Theravadas as being selfish but one of the things that really inspired me, you know, going back to the reasons why we choose to practice, one of the things that inspired me to ordain was looking at someone like Ajahn Brahm and seeing just how effective he is in the world to bring like wholesome mind states to so many people. And I thought, well, look, if, if I can do that or if I can just do 10% even of what Ajahn Brahm is able to do to bring those wholesome qualities and bring that much goodness to the world. It's like the most effective thing you can do for the world, right? It's just that practice, bringing up those good qualities. And yeah, so that's something that I do reflect on, you know, and, and that can motivate me for my meditation. That can motivate me to bring up the kind of qualities that we spoke about today. So hope that answers your question. That's great. Thank you. Thank you. Any final questions for the last five minutes? <laughs> Susie? Um, something that just struck me is um, the whole yeah. reflection part. Um, I know lay people can like have a journal, but do do monks and nuns have journals? Like, do you write down like, oh, today I was reflecting on such and such? Um, I've got friends who do. I've got a I've got a monk friend who's kept a journal for like twenty years, and he's he's kept on doing that. 
But um, I think he says that he doesn't do it like every single day, but it's, it's like a, a way for him to help process different things. And for myself, I like to kind of, I don't keep a journal per se, but I'll keep notes sometimes if I'm going through like a big period of change in, in my life or something like that and I'm trying to process things, then I'll write things down or if, if yeah, if, it's generally when things are changing quite significantly. Like I did a lot of writing and stuff at the beginning of COVID because that was like a really kind of intense situation for all of us. We really didn't know what was going on, for example. And, um, you know, I look back on those things and I actually wrote some, some things that are kind of worth reflecting on and stuff in that sense. I don't necessarily write a journal every day, but, uh, yeah, that, that's useful. But we were talking about this at lunch the other day and saying how, like, at the beginning of our practices, we'd kind of have these, like, insights and we're like, oh, I've got to quick write that down. That's really important. And then we kind of realised that it seemed really wise at the time and then you go back and read those things and and sometimes it's like, oh, yeah, you know, I've just kind of integrated that into my life now. So, you know, it, it can be useful to process your thoughts, but uh, you can also see that just just kind of going with the flow is nice as well. So I think it both works both ways and it works differently for different people. So, you know, I might also create like little sketches and stuff like that. I know a few years ago I was doing a lot of sketches on my iPad, just doing little doodles and stuff. And I don't know um, if anyone's seen uh, Venerable Yoda, who's on Suta Central, um, and they did some excellent kind of veneer sketches and did some Dharma doodles and stuff like that, and that was their way of kind of processing things at that time, and that was really cool. So if you haven't checked out those, then that's another way that kind of monastics use creativity. There was a website that uh, Ajahn Nisivo was running for a while called the the Fourth Messenger, I think it was, and that was kind of showcasing different monastics, writing and art and stuff and poetry. Unfortunately, a lot of it's not there anymore. There's some of the writing, but a lot of the art got taken down. Um, but that's also maybe worth looking up if you're interested in that kind of creative aspect of of spiritual practice. Yeah. So. so I do, I do. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay so I think we are all done I'm just checking the chat myself and getting better at the zoom thing so I'll hand it back to the hosts and yeah the... for me venerable and thank you very much for joining today and giving us a very valuable talk on developing the path that also Link it being a valuable community member in today's world, increased conflicts and divisiveness. Mm. Today's program is offered on a donation basis in the spirit of generosity. And as you know, with your generosity, Anukampa Bikuni Project and Venerable Chanda can provide the community and the wide world with valuable Dhamma talks, teachings, talks like these, meditation retreats, and Anukampa exists solely from your kind generosity, and we gain good karma by enabling the teachings to happen. And uh, we'll now add the link for the, in, for the donation in the box. Um, and also, uh, Ajahn Brahm's retreats are now full in November, for November, but there may be some space for some talks and links are there in the website. Uh, and uh, the newsletter, and you may have, um, um, you know, tools to share in your WhatsApp with your friends on Ajahn Brahm's um, talks as well in our social media, um, and check on the events, and uh, there may be, you know, things, and uh, check in our social media as well. And also, Venerable Chanda will be back in the monastery from early November, and if you are able, you can be part of giving dana food, either in person or remotely. Uh, please contact um, team at anukampaproject.org for more details. Thank you very much, Venerable, for coming. And thank you all for being part of a lovely community. Sorry, sorry, sorry.